All right. Um, so we're really very pretty close to finishing this unit on um, on um, solutions. And today I'm going to talk about some more of those colligative properties, which are properties of liquids that change when a solute is dissolved in them. And also the, way, the, the extent to which those properties change depends on the amount of dissolved solute, meaning the number of particles more than the identity. It doesn't depend on the identity. So we're working our way through this topic of colligative properties. And like I said, these are of liquids, um, but these properties change when a solution is made. So when you have a dissolved solute. I've said this before, um, and, it's a, and the degree of the change degree has only two E's. <laughs> so the degree of change depends on the concentration of dissolved solute, but it doesn't matter what those solutes are. Everything is once, right? I got somebody coming in. <laughs> okay, so I actually started talking about this last time. And the first example that I'd like to give you is, um, I already talked about this as well. This is vaporization. So vapor pressure is one of those properties that changes when a solute is dissolved in the liquid. So here, the pure liquid, the pure solvent is blue. So the solvent is blue and the solute is red. So we have a closed container and we know that you achieve a certain vapor pressure in that closed container. And, 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 and it's actually an equilibrium process, which is why these two arrows in the first diagram are equal in length. So in other words, we have the same rate of evaporation as the rate of condensation or, um, you yeah, know, that's what it's called. So what happens when you put a solute into the liquid? Those are the red molecules that are shown here, okay? When you put a solute in, you actually make it harder for those liquid molecules to find their way to the surface and get into the vapor. So what happens is that the evaporation process is interfered with by the, sol by the solutes that are present. And that's what lowers the vapor pressure. So what happens is you end up with a greater rate of condensation, which this arrow is bigger than this one temporarily and then what happens is that it re-equilibrates. But when it re-equilibrates, there's actually less solvent in the vapor than there was before. So the vapor pressure has gone down. And if you count the molecules here, I guess is how the illustrator that I borrowed this picture from, um, I guess that's, you know, that's their indication that the vapor pressure has decreased. So if you count these, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. You have 12 molecules in the vapor, which is a ridiculously small number, but here you have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you've eliminated some of the molecules that are in the vapor. So um, anyway, so that's just a silly illustration of that. Um, but what ends up happening, okay, so basically when you have a pure, the pure liquid, we call the vapor pressure, and, and oh, by the way, we call the solvent is going to be A, right? And the solute, I might as well write that down here. This, we have a mixture of a solvent 
and a solute. Oh, and last time I talked quite a bit about what is meant by a non-volatile, <laughs> non-volatile solute. What is a non-volatile solute? What does it mean for something to be volatile? Can somebody answer me that? All you have to do is click on that little microphone and your microphone goes on <laughs> and you can answer my question. What is a non-volatile thing? What does it mean to be volatile? <laughs> How many people are in here? 44 people. Come on, someone's got to know the answer to that. What does it have to do with? It's whether it gets, yes, please. Easily evaporated. Yes, yeah, that's right. It's whether it gets into the vapor or not. So something that is non-volatile does not have a vapor pressure, has basically no vapor pressure of its own. So the solute is not contributing to the vapor. So when you look at this picture, you don't see any red molecules in the vapor there. There's only blue molecules in the vapor. And that's because this first easiest example of this vapor pressure um, lowering, which is what we're looking at here, how the vapor pressure is lowered by the presence of a solute. The first example that we use is a non-volatile solute, something that doesn't evaporate itself. So the solvent, I'm denoting by as A, and the solute is B, okay? And the, the vapor pressure above pure liquid A, right? That's basically the first picture here, right? Right here. That is what we, that we call PA, the, the pressure above liquid A, but with a little zero here because this means it's above pure liquid A. And we distinguish that from the vapor pressure above a solution of B in A, okay? So it's gonna be smaller, we call that PA. So the vapor pressure ab above a solution of solute B in A, we call PA. But when it's above the pure liquid A, it's PA naught or PA zero. And what happens is, is that this vapor pressure above the solution, so VP above the solution is always less than PA zero. And that's why we call this phenomenon the vapor pressure lowering because the presence of the solute of the solute, which we have called B, lowers the vapor pressure. And of course, and I've already told you that's because the solute really interferes with the um, evaporation process, okay? All right. So, um, so if we take the PA naught, the PA zero, this is the vapor pressure above the pure liquid, and we subtract the vapor pressure above the solution, this is the thing that we actually call the vapor pressure lowering. This is the amount that the vapor pressure is lowered. So that's just literally, a, that's a scientific term there, the vapor pressure lowering. And because this pressure, which is above the solution, is always lower, so this is always smaller than this is, is larger. And because of that, this delta P is always positive, okay? So we don't ever have to worry about it being negative. It's not going to be negative. Okay. So the amount that that vapor pressure decreases by, remember I told you it depends on concentration, right? So the delta P depends on the concentration of dissolved solute, which we call B, 
okay? And in fact, we know, uh, well, it depends on that. That's the first thing it depends on. But the second thing it depends on is what the vapor pressure is of that pure liquid, okay? So it depends on the vapor pressure of the pure solvent as well. And it's a really simple relationship. The delta P is equal to the mole fraction of the solute. That's what this is, mole fraction of the solute. I'm gonna do an example um, in a, just a little bit so you'll see how that works out. Times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. That's what this PA0 is. So, you know, it's not all that complicated. But there, the thing about this equation is it has solute in it, right? Mole fraction of B, and it also has solvent in it. And what we'd like to do is figure out, can we relate this vapor pressure that happens, the, 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 the smaller vapor pressure that is above the solution, can we relate that to something that just depends on concentration of A, of the solvent? So if you think about it, this mole fraction of B, well, mole fractions always add up to be one. Okay, this is true. If you have a mixture of two things, their mole fractions will always sum up to one. So what I can do is I can actually take and substitute one minus XA, right? If I subtract XA from both sides, that gives me XB. And so I'm going to take this and substitute the one minus XA in here for XB. And I'll get that delta P equals, and I'm gonna put that one minus XA in here, one minus XA times PA zero. Okay, too many colors, I'm sorry. And so now I'm just gonna multiply this out, right? So that's PA zero minus XA PA zero. And by the way, I honestly don't care if you know how to derive this formula. We're gonna get to a formula, it's a very simple formula. And then you could forget the derivation if you don't like that sort of thing. So. So by substituting that in, we get this, this relationship here, but we know already that the vapor pressure lowering is PA zero minus PA. So if you look at this equation that you have here, if you just look at this part of it and you say, oh, look what happens if I subtract PA zero from both sides, then I end up with the result negative XA PA zero equals PA. Okay, so if you're following this, great. If you're not following it, we're not gonna be doing it much longer. I'm just gonna tell you what the relationship is. So, uh, so actually this is a negative PA there because I forgot to carry that negative sign. So we end up with XA, that's the mole fraction of the solvent times the Vapor pressure of the solvent when it's pure, when it's pure liquid, equals the vapor pressure above the liquid. So we have two pretty relatively easy equations, right? We have the one that I just showed you, that the vapor pressure lowering, well, first, actually, if we look at this equation, I just want to say something. What happens if the mole fraction of A equals 1? And this becomes one times PA zero equals PA. And that's true. The, the pressure above the solution, which is what PA means, would be the same as the pressure above the pure liquid if the mole fraction was one. It wouldn't be a solution. It would be pure liquid, right? So we basically have these two relatively simple equations. Like you can put that derivation away. If you like that sort of thing, that's nice, um, but I'm never gonna ask you to do it. So we have these two equations um, that have to do with the vapor pressure lowering. For the vapor pressure above a solution of a 
non-volatile solute B in a liquid solvent A. And these are the two equations. The vapor pressure lowering is the mole fraction of the solute times the original vapor pressure of the, um, of the pure liquid and the vapor pressure above the solution. So this is the vapor pressure above the solution equals XA, the mole fraction of the solvent times the original vapor pressure above the pure liquid. Okay, so let's see if we can do some, you know, pretty easy examples here using these equations so that you can see that maybe it's not as, as bad as you might think. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right. So we have a solution that says here that it's prepared by mixing 10 moles of, oh gosh, I thought I had the highlighter, <laughs> 10 moles of glucose. Now glucose is a solid and solids are considered to be non-volatile because you know it usually goes solid, goes to liquid, goes to gas. So most solids don't have a lot of vapor pressure of their gas phase sitting there above them. There's a few that do, those are rare really. Um, but anyway, we have 10 moles of that solute. So um, 10 moles of glucose, that's the solute. And I think I'm just gonna call it B for solute, okay? And then we have, um, hold on. Then we also have a thousand grams of water. That's the solvent. So we're gonna call that A, okay? So what is the mole fraction of water? So we're looking for XA, this is the solvent. What is the mole fraction of water? And XB, what is the mole fraction? I could call it W and G, but I think it's best if we just think of the solute as always being B and the solvent as always being A. So, which is gonna confuse me because of course in my notes I had it the other way, but that's all right. So XB is X glucose, let's keep it there, XH2O, so we'll just always remember it that way. So first we have to figure out we have to convert this 1,000 grams of, of water to moles. And that's 18 grams per mole. And this comes out to 55.5 uh, let's make it 015 there. So we don't want it to limit our sig figs. There we go, 55, that's a lot of moles, right? Because it's the solvent, so it should have more moles. And then we have 10 moles of glucose. So what is XB? That's the mole fraction of the glucose, the solute. And that is 10.0 over 10 plus 55.51, okay? And so that comes out to 0.153. So it's, you know, it's the minority component. There's less of it. And now I don't have to calculate X um, A in the same way. I can just say, well, the solvent X A's mole fraction is just one minus the mole fraction of the solute, one minus 0.153. And notice one is an exact number. So I'm not gonna limit the sig figs to, to one, it, it's just uh, going to be 0.847 is XA. So this is the mole fraction of water. Okay, so now that I have those mole fractions, the next part of the question says, it gives you the vapor pressure above pure water. Remember that is PA zero and it tells you that's 24 torr. So then it asks, what is the vapor pressure above the solution? So, well, we know what XA is and we know what PA zero is. And if you look up here to our master equations here, 
we know that PA is XA, PA zero. So PA, this is the vapor pressure of water above the solution is equal to XA, PA zero, and XA is that mole fraction, which was 0.847. And the PA zero is given here, it's 24 torr, okay? And so this comes out to 20.3 torr, although I only can keep two sig figs here. So I'm gonna underline that to let everybody know that's my last sig fig. So I just figured out what that, um, what the vapor pressure above this, the answer to that question is right here. But then it says, what is the vapor pressure lowering, the delta P? So there's two different ways I can figure that out, right? I can take the original 24, this is the PA zero, and subtract the 20.3. And when I do that, I get um, four tor, okay? Because I have to round it to one, um, because I, you know, I can't keep the decimal place because I don't have a decimal place here. So I kept to keep the ones place. Or I could do it this way. Delta P is XB, PA zero, okay? So that's 0.153, right? That's the mole fraction of the glucose times 24 equals 3.7 torr. And you can see that these are basically the same. So that's the, the different ways you can do that. So, I mean, um, it's, it's very, you know, I'm sure you've never heard that before. You've probably never heard of vapor pressure lowering, but, um, but it's, it's actually pretty important. Um, well, what's really more important, see, I'm gonna make a little decorative thing here. <laughs> what's really more important, um, is what happens when you have, so what if both A and B, both the solute and the solvent, if you would like to say, both of these are volatile. So this previous question was easy because I didn't have to worry about the vapor pressure of the solute. But now when we have mixtures of two things that both have their own vapor pressure, that's what this means. And now we tend to get rid of the term solvent and solute. And we actually call these are, these are, these are both components. We refer to two components of the mixture two parts and you have the part that's A and the part that's B. So when you hear me use that word, which I use a lot, components of the mixture, I'm referring either to A or B. I could say component A, component B, that's what it means, okay? So what if each of the components of the mixture are volatile? So here's a picture. I'm gonna just draw two beakers Here's with a watch glass on top, something to make the system closed. Okay, and I have, I have pure A here. And, you know, so it's coloring it red. So um, A is more volatile than B. And I'm going to represent that by putting more dots <laughs> over here. I'm gonna put 19 dots here. And now B, which I'm going to do as black, um, has 10 dots here. So this is PB zero. So which is more volatile, A or B? I have a chat here, anybody? 
Right. Well, that answer is not right, actually. The answer is the one that has the greater number of molecules in the vapor phase is the more volatile one. Remember, volatility is ease with which molecules get into the vapor phase. So I would say that A is more volatile because you've got more red dots in which are representing the gas above the liquid, right? Because this is gas then you have uh, B dots, okay. Anyway, all right, so now you put these guys together and you make a mixture. And I'm gonna need more room, hold on, let me do that first. Okay, so let's put these together. And so now we'll make uh, another beaker. And this beaker has A and B in it. Okay, so you've got some of both in there. And I'm gonna make it close by putting something on top of it. Oh, I don't want it to be red. <laughs> so it's closed. And now let's think about the vapor that's above this mixture of two components, A and B. And what happens is, is that each component interferes with the ability of the other one to get into the vapor phase, okay? So I'm gonna write that down. Each component, each part of the solution, A and B, interferes with the other one's ability to vaporize. You can think about it as being a physical thing of literally getting in the way. So each lowers the vapor pressure of the other. So over here, if we're gonna write the number of gas molecules, and I actually didn't mean to make this beaker look any different in size, because that, I don't want that to affect our analysis here. Ah, so I'm gonna draw the same size beaker Okay. And now instead of having 19 red dots, I'm going to have 10 red dots. So I have a lower vapor. The PA, the vapor pressure above the solution, is lower than it was above the pure liquid. And the same is true for B. So here for B, I had 10 dots. Now I'm going to draw six dots. <laughs> okay, so there is less, there's a lower, ooh. so PA is less than PA0, and PB is also less than PB0, so there are fewer dots of each one. Each lowers the vapor pressure of the other. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, it's not really important, but this equation here that we used before, this equation here is, has a name, it's called Routes Law. And it has to do with the fact that when you have a smaller mole fraction, you have a mole fraction that's not one of, a, of, of here the solvent, then it means the vapor pressure is lower than what it was when it was pure. And here we basically have a Routes Law for each of the components of this mixture. So we have that PA, is gonna be XA, PA zero. So that's Routes law for component A. And then we also have the same thing for component B. Well, that's very nice. It just decided to, just decided to do its first little thing of the day to drive me crazy. <laughs> okay. Um, it's still recording. Okay. And this is a Routes law hmm, for component A. So this is the vapor pressure above a solution of A and B. This is the mole fraction of component A. 
And this is the vapor pressure above pure A, pure liquid A. And then we have Routh's law for B, where you have basically PB is XB, PB zero. And again, this is the vapor pressure above, oh, I should say vapor of A above a solution, vapor pressure of B above a solution of A and B, mole fraction of B, and I think you can make extend with that. So each of these vapor pressures is proportional to its mole fraction and the vapor pressure of the corresponding pure liquid. So each of these vapor pressures is proportional to its mole fraction and the vapor pressure of the corresponding pure li liquid, okay? And all of that is big mouthful, but again, I think it's actually easier doing problems than it is to talk about it, okay? So let's take a look at this. Um, this is, let's see, the other one was um, activity seven. So this is still activity seven, number two. So if you have your activity sheets handy. So at 20 degrees C, the vapor pressure of pure water is 18 torr. And the vapor pressure of pure ethanol is much bigger, it's 44 torr, okay? So which is more volatile? Well, that, that's pretty, uh, Straightforward question, I think. More volatile simply means more able to evaporate, evaporates more easily. So which evaporates more easily? Well, anybody gonna chat me an answer here? The one with the higher vapor pressure, right? That's going to be the one that um, that evaporates more easily. So ethanol, because it has a higher vapor pressure above the pure liquid. Okay, so now we're getting into a problem where we have a mixture. So we have a solution prepared by mixing 92 grams of ethanol. So you know I'm gonna have to convert that to moles because I'm gonna have to find the mole fraction. Um, and 36 grams of water. So 19 grams of ethanol, 36 grams of water. Um, and so what it's saying is what is the mole fraction? Oh, okay, so first we're just finding the mole fractions. So the molar mass of ethanol is given and we know the water molar mass as well. Um, must be my intention in this problem to have just two sig figs. So 92 divided by 46 is two, 2.0 moles of ethanol, I'm gonna call it E, and two moles of water, okay? So you can see the mole fraction of ethanol is just two over two plus two. Does everybody understand this? This is the moles of ethanol divided by the moles of ethanol plus the moles of water. That's what a mole fraction is. What is the number of moles? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, so this is 0. 0.50. That's the mole fraction of ethanol. So what's the mole fraction of water? I'm looking at the chat. Come on, somebody. What do you think the same formula? It's the same value and the same formula, right? Because everything is two. So it's two over two plus two again. So it's 0 0.50. So we basically have a mixture of ethanol and water where we have equal moles of ethanol and water in that mixture. We have a 50-50 mole mixture really of ethanol and water. So it's a 50-50 mixture in terms of moles. 
you know, they have different molar masses. So you actually have a lot more mass of ethanol. But when you think about the moles, it's actually a 50-50 mixture. Um, OK, so now we're up to what are the partial pressures of ethanol and water? What should I do here? Whatever. All right. So the partial pressure of ethanol is the mole fraction of ethanol times the vapor pressure of ethanol when there is no solution, when it's just pure ethanol, okay? So it's 0.5. And what number do I put next to it? What's PE zero? Because half of this is interpreting what this information is. And if you go back and look at the beginning. Is it's it 24? Yes, it's tw 24, no, 44. 44. Yeah, 44. Right, there's a previous problem where it was uh, 24, but here's 44. Okay, great. So that's 22 tor. Pick nice numbers, right? And the part pro pressure above the water is X water, P0 water. So it's 0.5 times, you go back and look up here, it's 18, okay? So I'm gonna put that in. So that's nine tour, not, not very impressive amount. But here's the big thing, here's like the payoff, right? Which the vapor pressure above this solution, is the vapor pressure above the solution richer in ethanol or richer in water? So what we're talking about here is we have a mixture, a liquid mixture that's literally 0.50 mole fraction of ethanol and 0.50 of water. So we have equal molar amounts in the liquid of each component, the ethanol and the water. Um, and now when we think about what's above that liquid, okay, over here, we have PE is 22 tor and PW is nine. So we have a 50-50 mixture in the liquid, but in the vapor, we have a much greater pressure of the ethanol. In fact, this is really like 22 tor PE to PW to nine. That's, a, that's almost two to one in the vapor favoring the more volatile component. So I would say that the vapor um, has proportionally more ethanol than the liquid. And, and the reason for that is because ethanol is more volatile. <laughs> so you can have a 50-50 mixture in the liquid, but the vapor is dominated by the more volatile component. And this leads me to talk to you about a very important technique that is used to separate liquids of different volatilities, which are those liquids that have different vapor pressures also will have very different boiling points. So this leads to a method of separating two liquids with different volatility, which implicitly means that they have different vapor pressures, right? Those, those um, vapor pressure above the pure liquid. Um, and so different boiling points. So this is a method um, that's we tend to say that it's for separating liquids of different boiling points and it is called distillation. Now distillation, um, I thought while I'm on the topic, maybe I would tell you how whiskey is made. <laughs> um, because, you know, um, 
the way that the alcohol and, and things like, like whiskey is made stronger is by using distillation. And back in the days of the, um, what was it called when they, uh, prohibition, when it was illegal to have alcohol, there were stills, distillation apparatuses in various rural locations where they would be making whiskey illegally. And oh, anyway, so there's all kinds of folk music around that and everything. But anyway, I thought I would would tell you a little bit about this. And I, I have um, a slide. I'm not going to go through these details, but if anyone's interested, um, I have this slide on whiskey making, which I took from a reference you could see. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to sort of go through some of it. Oh, let me just tell you, give you the definition here. So distillation is a process of separating a mixture of liquids with different boiling points. And in the case of concentrating whiskey, you're trying to separate ethanol from water. So ethanol's boiling point is 78.4 and water's is 100. So when you heat the, this mixture of ethanol and water, the ethanol will boil off first. And so the what you collect on the other side in the distillation flask, will have proportionally more ethanol because what you're doing is condensing that vapor and the vapor favors the ethanol. So what's coming out will favor the ethanol as well. Um, so let's get back to where I was. Okay, so when you make whiskey, you basically you have to mix a lot of things together and it starts with sprouting literally grain and that makes something called malted grain this will not be on any exam. <laughs> and what that does is it produces enzymes that are needed um, to break starch into sugars. Okay, then you have to add something very important and that is the yeast that you have to add because yeast promotes um, uh, fermentation. And in fermentation, that's how you can convert sugar to alcohol, okay, which is what, you know, making alcoholic drinks is sort of based on. And so, um, and you'll also add water and you'll heat this up. And, and so you've got all this stuff from the grain and from the yeast and from the water. So what you end up with is something they, um, well, it's a mixture of water and then it's got sugar in it, right? Because not all the sugar was converted to alcohol. And you have alcohol, which is ethanol. That's the alcohol that it is. And then you have a lot of different flavor components, you know, depending on what you use to make the whiskey. And, um, and then what you do is you filter this. And so you get rid of the solids and, and the rest of it, the liquid part in the language is called the wash, okay? And it's put in the vat. <laughs> so, the, so, so you have this thing, let's say this is the vat, okay? <laughs> Where you have this blend of, of filtered liquids. This is the wash right here, okay? So, so here's your flask and let's just suppose, cause it's possible that in this liquid here, you have a one-to-one -one mixture of ethanol and water. Well, we know is we just did the problem that if you have a, a, a liquid with a one-to-one -one ratio by mole of ethanol to water, 50-50 like we have, that above that, okay, that above that in the vapor, you'll have 22 tor as the partial pressure of water and nine, oh, sorry, that's the partial pressure of ethanol. Oh, just lost the vat. <laughs> okay. And nine tor as the partial pressure of water. So that literally is a two to one ratio of ethanol to water in the vapor. 
So my question is, you know, how can we use this phenomenon to end up with whiskey that's stronger than what we started it with, right? So we want to concentrate the alcohol. So what we're going to do essentially is to condense the vapor. And since the vapor has more ethanol in it than the liquid did, we will effectively be concentrating the ethanol. Okay, so, so kind of the goal is to like pull the vapor off the top and condense it. And I have a picture here of a distillation apparatus. And this is used in labs all across the country and the world, really. Um, and so what you'd have, and this would be kind of like the vat if this was a you know whiskey making operation, you'd be heating up the liquid. So you have, this is your one-to-one -one, say mixture of ethanol and water, you heat it up and the vapors rise in this tube. And we know that this vapor is richer in ethanol then in water, because ethanol has a higher vapor pressure and a consequently lower boiling point. So then, well, how are you going to condense the vapor? So all those vapors are mingling over here. And now we have this long tube here called the condenser. And this literally is where the condensation of the vapor happens. And the way it happens is you take cold water. So this, this condensation tube has an inner, com inner compartment and an outer compartment. So notice there's blue on the outside. This is like a cross section. And what you do is you put cold water through the outside of this flask, of this, of this condenser. And basically it fills up the outside and you keep it running. So you have constantly got replenishing the cold water. And what's inside the tube that's where the vapor is. So you have these vapor molecules, they come in here and guess what? They turn to liquid. So they end up being droplets and then they drip out into the collection flask. Okay, so this is the collection flask. This is called the distillate, okay? Now, all those other molecules are gonna end up in the vapor as well. There's gonna be water in the vapor. You're not gonna completely keep it out. So if you do this process once, so doing it once, we call simple distillation, you will end up with a higher concentration of ethanol in the distillate that you collect in that collection flask. But this is not just used for whiskey making. <laughs> this could be used to absolutely purify. Suppose you had a mixture of water and ethanol and you just wanted pure ethanol. You would have to do this process many times. You have to do it over and over again. Or you can get the same effect, okay? by using what we call a fractional distillation apparatus. So this apparatus is similar, but it has a longer column. And I'm referring to this here. And these lines here are representing um, places, that, like plates where the ethanol could condense um, and then it re-evaporates and recondenses. So all the all the vapors in here, they're they're kind of evaporating, then condensing on these plates and evaporate. So it's as if with every one of these plates, you're doing another simple distillation. So by the time you get up here, you're going to have pretty much pure ethanol. And down here, you're gonna you know so that pure, so pure ethanol is gonna come over first. And so here you would end up with pure ethanol. And that's because the fractionating column, it effectively evaporates and recondenses 
the ethanol many times. Each time it gets purer. Each time there's less water in the vapor because every time you're doing that, you have that two to one ratio in the vapor. Um, well, <laughs> that's if you have a one to one mixture If the mixture. Well, I don't want to get too complicated, but uh, I just want you to have an idea of this because this is used in organic chemistry all the time. Distillation is very important technique. Um, so does anyone want to ask me anything about that? How are you guys doing? Okay. Good. All right. So that's really all I have to say about vapor pressure lowering. Um, in fact, I one of the reasons I cover that topic, frankly, is because I know that you're going to run into distillation in organic chemistry, and you kind of need to know where it's coming from. But the next thing I'm going to talk about is another colligative property, and there's actually two of them two more colligative properties, properties that change with the amount of dissolved solute, not the identity. And those two are called boiling point elevation and going along with that. And this is in line with the lab this week is freezing point depression. So I, I posted that lab handout for my students, and I'm sure Mrs. Sayak did as well for her class. So these are the next two things we're going to talk about. And this is how the boiling point can be affected by a dissolved solute. So the boiling point of the solution is greater, so it's elevated, than the boiling point of pure liquid. And the freezing point of the solution is actually lower than the freezing point of the pure liquid. And so, you know, what's the reason for this? So the presence of the solute, this is sort of a um, very similar reason that I've been giving you for the previous one. The presence of the solute interferes with the evaporation process. Well, it interferes with evaporation, but it doesn't have any effect on condensation. So that's gonna mean that you need more heat to, um, to boil because you have to get to that certain pressure. So it interferes with evaporation um, and that leads to a, uh, so the, with the ability to vaporize, right? So that leads to a higher boiling point, and also it could interfere with the freezing process. And you really can literally think that the solutes are getting in the way. Because when, when something freezes, those water molecules have got to come together and form a crystal, okay? And then crystallization starts around that but if there's solute interfering with water molecules getting near each other, then it's going to interfere with that process of crystallization. If it interferes with freezing, it means you're going to have a lower, you're going to need, um, you're going to have a lower temperature for the freezing point. Okay, so it's going to be below zero degrees for for H2O water. Okay, um, so this means you need a, a higher boiling point. There's a higher temperature is needed for boiling, okay? And you um, need a lower temperature is needed for freezing. But you know, the freezing point and the melting point are the same temperature, it's the same thing. Okay, the, 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 when you melt a liquid, it's zero degrees. That's where the temperature will stay constant until everything is converted to ice. If you're cooling, uh, if, you're, if you're heating, it's the other way around. 
it'll be ice until everything is converted to, to liquid. And all that happens at zero degrees. That's where the horizontal portion of that cooling curve or heating curve is. As I talked about the cooling curve, well, I never mentioned the heating curve. But since these two are the same and you need a lower temperature for freezing, it means that the melting is going to happen at a lower temperature. And that's why we add salt to roads in the winter, because it means that that ice will melt at a lower temperature. And that's what we want, so we don't have accidents. So, um, so that's why salt is, add, is added to roads, put on roads in the winter. And it's to melt ice or prevent ice from forming. Because you would need a lower temperature for that ice to form. Now this is not gonna work necessarily when the temperature is negative 20 degrees. So if you live in Minnesota or in Northern Maine, um, there's a limit to what the added salt can do. Um, and I've looked that up at one point, but I, I, I can't remember what I found out. So that's one practical application of freezing point depression. Um, there's another I want to talk about, which is, um, well, it's very similar, why you add antifreeze to the car radiator. Because you don't want that fluid, that radiator fluid to freeze. So it would require a lower temperature to freeze. And so it doesn't freeze, okay? This is especially when the car is not running because when it's running, believe me, it's plenty hot. It doesn't matter. And this is really when the car is still because when it's running, there's a lot of heat that comes out of the engine that um, heats up the radiator fluid. But then also by adding antifreeze, right? So antifreeze, I'll put it in quotes, is also good in the summer. Why would it be good in the summer? <laughs> Do you want that radiator fluid to boil? Do you want it to have a high vapor pressure and evaporate? Well, it's closed, so some of this isn't so important, but if you have a leak or something. Well, anyway, it would keep the boiling point um, it would raise the boiling point, I guess is what I want to say. Okay, and it decreases the vapor pressure. So it prevents evaporation or it slows it down anyway. Okay, so that would be why you'd want to have it in your car in the summer. Um, so there'd be less loss of water through evaporation. Okay, so that's very interesting. The boiling point goes up, the freezing point goes down. So boiling point elevation, I call BPE, um, or it's also referred to as delta TB, the temperature the delta TB is the boiling point elevation, and it is the difference between the boiling point of a solution and the boiling point of the pure solvent. Now notice the way this is defined, okay? It's a simple subtraction. The boiling point of the solution is higher. The boiling point of the solvent is lower. So we define the delta TB so that it comes out positive, okay? because the solution has a higher temperature than the pure liquid. But when we do this for freezing point depression, which I call delta TF, that is now the freezing point of the pure solvent minus the freezing point of the solution. And I, I reverse these here, right? Because now the freezing point is lower than what it was before. 
So this is actually smaller number and this is a larger number. So again, this comes out positive. And the nice thing is with water, H2O, the freezing point is zero degrees C. So if, the, uh, if you add a solute and now your freezing point is negative 2.3 degrees C, all right? If you take the TF of pure solvent, delta TF is zero, that's zero, minus, minus 2.3, it's plus 2.3 degrees C. So the freezing point depression for a solution in water is always the negative of what the freezing temperature is. And that's because the, the freezing point of pure water is zero. But if you have a compound whose freezing point is not zero, that's not gonna be so, it's not gonna be like that. Just for water, it comes out that it's very simple that whatever the freezing point is, the freezing point depression is, the, is that with a positive sign. Okay, that's just because water's freezing point is zero degrees. Um, okay, so again, the, these, this phenom these two phenomena, freezing point depression and boiling point and elevation. So these two things, delta TF and delta TB and on the concentration of dissolved solutes. And guess what? Whereas the previous one we did, the concentration that we needed to calculate was small fraction. This depends, these depend on the concentration in molality units, which is why we even teach you that. And KB, this is a proportion. The freeze, the boiling point elevation is proportional to the molarity. And this is the proportionality constant, excuse me, which we call the boiling point elevation constant. And this is different for different solvents. So it depends on the solvent. So it's different if the solvent's water or ethanol or whatever it is. And we have basically the same equation, but with a slightly different modification because we have an F instead of a B. This is the freezing point depression constant for the particular solvent. And again, we have, this is the molality. And I don't know if you've watched that video yet on concentration units, but molality, is the moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So it's a little bit different from molarity, okay? It's, it's close because a kilogram of water weighs about, uh, 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 is about a liter in volume. So this is almost the same as molarity if we're talking about a solution in water. So molarity and molality Are, are similar, very close for aqueous solutions, but not for other things. And anyway, it's a little bit different because this does not say per liter of solution. It says per kilogram of solvent, not solution. Okay. So these are like the basic, the basic equations. We have delta TB is KBM and delta TF is KFM. Um, but there's a bit of a complication that arises when we have um, ionic solutes, especially. And that we're going to look at in lab today as well. So we have a complication, which is really one complication. ionic solutes. And the reason that it gets a little bit, a little more complicated is because when you have an ionic solute, so suppose you have potassium, um, uh, potassium bromide or something like that. Okay. 
and you put that in solution, okay? It gives you potassium ions and bromide ions, okay? So you started out with, this is one formula unit. Hold on a sec. So you, if you have one formula unit of KBr, I don't call it a molecule because we know it's not a molecule, it's repeating KB, K plus Br minus K plus Br minus on all sides, okay? One formula unit of KBr leads to two particles. You have a potassium and you have a bromide. And the whole thing about colligative properties is it doesn't matter what those particles are. They can be positively charged ions. They could be a molecular compound. The fact is, is that you get two particles here for every one formula unit. And you're going to have to account for that, okay? If you had something say like calcium chloride, that's gonna give you a calcium ion when it dissolves and two chloride ions. So here you get for one formula unit of calcium chloride, you get one of these and two of these, you get three particles. Okay, so um, if you had the same number of moles of KBr dissolved as calcium chloride, you'll end up with about one and a half times the freezing point depression for that solution of calcium chloride as you had for KBr because you have more particles. You have more bang for your buck and a little bit like that. Okay, so, so what's often done or what is done really is instead of using um, this simple equation, okay, or for the boiling point, very similar, is we put in a little I here. Okay, this I has a fancy name, which you don't have to learn. It's called a Van't Hoff factor. <laughs> and it is as simple as this. The I is the number of ions per formula unit for an ionic compound. Now there are other things that could make this I be other than one, but for a molecular compound, they don't break into anything. I is generally equal to one, okay? But um, if you had a solution of KBr, what would the I equal for KBr? It would be two, okay? And that would basically double the effective molality because you would have twice the concentration of anything. Um, because like I said, identity doesn't matter. For here, I would equal three because you're getting three particles for every um, formula unit. Um, you will, there are some crazy examples, some interesting examples. Um, what would you think if I were less than one? So you dissolve some, a number of particles and, you and let's say you measure the freezing point of the solution and you know the molality and you solve for I, because let's say you know the freezing point depression constant. So let's say you know uh, the molality and Kf and you measure delta Tf and you solve for I. And let's say you get a number like, you know, a number less than one. What is that? What would that mean? You know, sometimes it helps to think about the opposite thing, right? What does an I greater than one mean? What did an I mean? You know, we had say potassium chloride. You had an I of two. That means that something went in there and it's divided into two. You got two things for every one that was dissolved. You can think about it that way. So if I is less than one, the opposite thing must be happening, right? What if two particles 
sometimes combine together. So it must mean that there's some kind of coming together or aggregation of particles. Pretty interesting. That's why I said that the exceptions are always the interesting part of chemistry. You could have something like that happen. I say intermolecular forces even, if they were strong enough. And they, anyway, all right, let's do a normal example, okay? So here's an example. What is the freezing point of a solution of 17.5 grams of aluminum chloride dissolved in 100 milliliters of water, okay? So ALCL3 So uh, we're going to try to find the freezing point. All right. So we have to find the molality first. And molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So can someone help me with part of this? What do I have to do in this problem? Come on, come on, let's do, come on. I'm talking to myself here. It's really dull standing, sitting here, looking at the screen. I don't even, I mean, is anybody even sharing their video today? Come on, people. I know it's Monday. All right, somebody says convert grams to moles. Yes. So I have 17.5, whoever you are, thank you, Madison, good. 17.5 grams, the molar mass of ALCL3. I'm going to tell you that it's 133.34 grams per mole. And so that comes out to 0.131 moles of aluminum chloride. Okay, so what do I do to get the molality now? Um, I'm told that you have, a, oops, a 100 milliliter. So what we have to do is make an assumption about the density. And we're going to assume that the density of water at whatever temperature of this experiment is one gram per milliliter. So we're, you know, we're making an assumption here. It's not a bad assumption. So now I'll take my 100 milliliters and that will just be 100 grams, right? Because I could just multiply. So 100 grams is 0 0.100 kilograms, right? I divide by a thousand. So now I'll take my 0 0.131 moles over 0 0.100 kilograms, and that's the molality. So I'm dividing by 0 0.1, that's multiplying by 10. That's 1.31 molal which we actually write as 1.31 with a little m. So those of you who, is it at one minute? Didn't I say 0 0.1 kilograms? Ashley, I just, I just use more sig figs than you did, that's all. Right? Yeah, I sent that before you did the whole thing, sorry. Oh. Oh, good, good. That's good. You knew that. So anyway, just I just want to say that if you if you're one of the people that tends to use a little M to represent moles, I always use MOL for moles. 
you get a little confused here because it means molality. Okay, so we have the molality now. So all we need Oh, I have to tell you the KF, the freezing point depression constant. For H2O is 1.86 degrees C per molal. Crazy, but that's what it is. And now what is I? So this is something we also need to know. We know this is 1.86. We know the molality is 1.31. So let me put the units in here. Degrees C per molal, 1.31 molal. It's not a hard calculation, but what is this I here? So let's go and let's think about it. We have AlCl3. When you put that in water, what do you get on the right side? It breaks up into ions, right? What's the charge on a chloride ion? Come on, come on, somebody tell me, chloride. Where, yeah, man minus one, good, a few people tell me, good. So you get chloride, how many of them do you get? There's three, right? So what's the charge on an aluminum ion then? If chloride is minus one, what does that mean aluminum has to be? Positive three. Yeah. So you start with one of these, you end up with four. So I is equal to four here. Okay. So that means I'm going to put four in here. And when you do the math there, you end up with nine, uh, nine point seven five degrees C. So if this is the delta TF, what does that mean that the freezing point will be if this is water? This is the difference between the freezing point, which is zero, and the freezing point of the solution. So it'll be negative 9.75 degrees C. That's the freezing point of the solution. Okay. All right. So um, here's a, an activity, activity eight. And what this illustrates is how, let's see, Oh yeah, we're gonna find, okay, so you can actually use freezing point depression. So FPD or BPE can be used to determine molar mass of an unknown. Okay, so that's what this next problem is about. So in a problem like this, you would be, or in a situation like this, you would be given the freezing point depression or the boiling point elevation. And, um, and you would be able to use, let's say if it's freezing point and let's say it's molecular. So I is equal to one times the molality. So what you could do is take your delta TF over I KF and get the molality. So once you have the molality, you can use the kilograms of the solvent to get the moles. And finally, you could take the number of grams over the number of moles and you get the molar, the molar mass. So, you know, this is a little bit theoretical, but here is a nice example that I'm going to do, okay. So ethylene glycol is used as an antifreeze. It's soluble in water and has a high enough boiling point to be considered non-volatile. Okay, that's not for the first part of the problem. The first part of the problem is when 651 grams is dissolved 
in 2505 grams of water. And we have 651 grams of ethylene glycol. The freezing point is negative 7.8 degrees C. And it gives you the Kf for water is 1.86. So it says use the freezing point and the value of K to find the molality. So I'm going to use this formula, delta, this equation, delta TF is I KFM. Now, um, I would have to tell you that this is a molecular compound with an I of one, right? You really could only do this for a molecular compound or for an ionic compound if you happen to know what the I was. Like if there's a problem in the lab like that and you're given the I value. Um, but in this case, it's molecular compound. So I is generally equal to one. It doesn't break down, it doesn't aggregate usually. So, so we just have this formula or this equation. So the molality is just the freezing point depression over Kf. Now, is the delta TF here negative 7.8? No. It's always, remember, this is the freezing point of the solution. So it's the freezing point of the pure solvent divided by minus the freezing point of the solution. Zero minus minus 7.80. So it's plus. So you just change the sign if it's water. So this is 7.80 degrees C over 1.86 is, um, um, what is it? <laughs> 4.19 molal. So that's the molality. So now molality equals the moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So that means that the, we call that little m. So that means that the molality times the kilograms of solvent gives you the moles. So if I take that 4.19, right? And now going back up here, I had 2000, oops, not too far. This was the amount of water to 2505 grams. So that's 2.505 kilograms. I divided by a thousand. So 2.505. Okay, when I do this, I'm going to get the moles of solute, which is 10.5 moles of um, the solute. But now I was given the grams. So molar, molar mass is grams, the number of grams over the number of moles. So that's 600, what was it? 51 over two, over um, four, what was it? 10.5. <laughs> which is 62.0 grams per mole, which is indeed the molar mass of ethylene glycol. Um, okay, so that's how you would use it to find the uh, molar mass of something. Um, would you keep this in your car radiator in the summer? I, I talked about this, how it would prevent evaporation, it would lower the boiling point, sorry, boiling point. So it would be harder to boil off that's that um, radiator fluid. And this is just a question that speaks back to something we did earlier today. Um, what would the vapor pressure of water be above the solution? Um, so if you remember, um, let's see. Vapor pressure of water would be hmm, 
the mole fraction of water times the vapor pressure above pure water. And the mole fraction would have to be calculated. So to get the mole fraction, um, you'd have to take that 2,505 grams and convert it to moles. It comes down to 139.1. So let's just call it 139. Um, and then we had 10.5 moles of the solute so X water is 139 over 139 plus 10, right? That was the moles of the other component. Um, and so that comes out to 0.923. And so this is 0.923 times 17.5. So it's 16.3. So it's just an illustration of something we did earlier in class. So I just wanted to go over that. All right, now I made a video on osmosis and I have time to go over a little bit of this today. Um, but the video is just like me talking. It's really kind of the same thing. Um, but I, I'm gonna show you the beginning of this video. I don't think I can get through it in the time I have left. So I'm gonna start it and then you can watch the video or watch the rest of it on the video. It's posted already. It's been there all weekend on YouTube. Okay, so the last colligative property, like I said, is osmosis. Um, and osmosis has to do with water flow. It's the flow of water. So something we call a semi-permeable membrane. That's a membrane with small pores, small openings that only allow the uh, movement of very small particles, which is why for our purposes, it's generally only water that flows through that membrane. So it's a flow of water through a semi-permeable membrane because larger particles can't fit from a region of low concentration of solutes, of dissolved solutes. And it doesn't matter what they are, it's part of the whole colligative thing, to a region of higher concentration of solutes. So we're talking about two liquids that have a semi, some kind of membrane between them with very small openings. And it turns out that the flow will always be to equalize the concentration. So basically we're talking about having, you know, liquid, uh, we're having a, two, two solutions or maybe pure, you know, maybe you'd have a concentration of solute on one side more than the other, and you'll get the flow of water. There'll be a net flow to try to um, dissolve, to try to, sorry, to try to um, dilute the higher concentration. So the net flow will be to dilute the higher concentration of solutes, um, you know, to equalize the concentrations on both sides of that good old semi-permeable membrane. Now, the, the way I like to illustrate this um, is to make eggs, to take eggs. <laughs> so, you know, eggs have a shell, but you know, underneath that shell, oh, underneath that shell is a membrane. It doesn't come out, but it looks like, so this is the membrane. And so what I like to do is I like to remove the shell. 
Okay, and that's kind of what this video is about. So I'm just going to show a little bit of it, the beginning of it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, share screen. Where is it? Oh well, I'll have to do it on my other computer. I think. Oh, come on, people. Oh. Well, I'm really screwed here. <laughs> I can't figure out how to do this. Why isn't it coming up? Let me do that. I'll try it now. Hold on. There it is, okay. So this, this, this part of the video, it's showing, I'm gonna mute it and just play a little bit of it. What it's showing is that the calcium carbonate is actually the, what the shell is made of. And what I do is I soak these eggs in vinegar, that's acetic acid, and it produces carbon dioxide and water and calcium acetate, doesn't matter what else. But the idea is it changes, it takes this solid off and basically um, you know, eats it away and ends up forming carbon dioxide and some other products. Um, and so what I do is I take my, the, the eggs with the shells on them. And you could do this at home with a brother, a little brother or sister or something. They might love this, especially around Halloween because it's kind of gooey and yucky. Um, and you take, here's the egg and you put it in with the vinegar and you start seeing all this gas coming out and uh, it gets very frothy. And sometimes you have to change the vinegar before you can get all the shell. It takes a day or two. It's not that um, quick. Um, but then um, when you finish, this is what you end up with. Let me show you. Um, I had to add more vinegar because um, it wasn't. Is it okay? Everyone's hearing it? Yeah. yeah. Really getting rid of every last bit of the shell. And, um, and so I made these shellless eggs that I'm going to show you now. Um, and then I'll come back and I'll, I'll talk about what happened. So these are the eggs that I put inside of the vinegar. And um, this one looks kind of whitish because I actually just scraped off the last of the calcium carbonate here with my fingernail on this one. And you can see that um, um, now it's kind of clear. So there's a little bit left of that calcium carbonate. See how I'm scraping it off right now. And then I, get, I can make it go away. But I didn't do that on, on the eggs that I used for my experiments. So, they, so, so the eggs on the experiment had a teeny bit of a coating of calcium carbonate, but it, it really, the, the membrane really was exposed. They look more whitish like this, but they're both very squishy. 
and um, this is the membrane that's inside of the shell. So what I did was I, um, I took and placed an egg just like this into distilled water. And I wonder if you could see the difference here that the, this one is actually, well, actually you can't tell at all, but this one on my right, this one here is a lot larger than this one. I, 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 I don't know why it's not coming out on the camera like that, but I think this one is, is actually the bigger one here. It looks smaller, but it's not. Anyway, forget about that. That was in distilled water. I'll talk about that. But, but what I really want to show you is the most obvious one. So look at this. This is um, a really disgusting looking egg. Okay. Look how squishy it is. It looks like it's missing half of its liquid or at least a good portion of its liquid. And what happened was this stuff here, this ooey gooey, look at that, yucky stuff, that's just Cairo corn syrup, okay? It's really thick. It's a really strong concentration of sugar in there. And so what happened was the fluid in the egg actually moved out of the egg from a re because inside the egg, it's the solutes are at a lower concentration than outside the egg. And it doesn't matter that what's dissolved inside is protein and other things and what's dissolved outside is sugar. It's the number of particles that matters. And so osmosis takes the liquid from lower concentration to higher concentration of solutes and in doing so made this egg go from nice and robust and, and a little bouncy to being this sort of shriveled up thing. Um, and that's all from osmosis. So I think I've said enough about that and gotten myself dirty. <laughs> Okay, that's really all I wanted to show you on that. Um, hold on, one stop sharing. Let me go back to sharing here. Okay, so that's how you can um, have fun with chemistry at home by taking shells off of eggs and playing with them. So basically what I did just sort of just, cause I only really went over, you couldn't, couldn't see it so much with the distilled water, but actually it wasn't as bad as I thought. Um, so here I took my shellless egg and I put it in distilled water. Okay, and what ends up happening is that there's a lower concentration of solutes in the egg. And not, sorry, a lower concentration of solutes in the water. Oh, duh, in the distilled water. So the flow is into the egg from a higher, from a, a lower to a higher concentration. So you get a flow like that. So what happens then is that the egg expands, right? And you end up with a larger egg. I'll exaggerate it there, larger expanded egg. And in the other case, when you have the corn syrup in here, that's such a high concentration of sugar that when you put your egg in that, what happens is the opposite. There's a flow of solutes, sorry, flow of water out of the egg. And so you end up with something that looks like this. The egg loses water. And then you get something with a much smaller volume of egg. And this is all due to, this is due to a process known as osmosis, okay? And I really don't have time to go into it today, but I, I, I have a short video, the rest of the video, it's not that short, but it's not that long. Um, and it talks about why this happens and how you have, you can come up with an equation that relates osmotic pressure, which is considered this pi, 
Okay, and it relates it to um, the molarity of the solution. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it's just like me explaining it in class, me explaining it on the video. So you really have to watch it, the video. Okay, and I do a problem at the end as well. So it's exactly the same as what I would do here, except that it would have to rush through it and it would be unpleasant. So I'm going to stop right there and have you watch the rest of it yourselves. Um, yeah, so some of you I'll see in lab tomorrow. I have the handout is posted. Please look at it. Um, I'm working on the tests. It'll be a while before I finish them. So um, I'm just going to have to be a little patient with me. And uh, I think that's it. Um, some of you I sent emails to, some of you in my lab. Um, of course, I was missing some things, but um, yeah. Uh, all right, have a nice afternoon. Uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you for staying. <laughs>